Morning. This is Friday, October 8th, and this qu this inquiry is now resumed. Good morning, sir. Mr. Cooper, um, you had indicated uh, yesterday that you were considering uh, making an application in respect to the statements that Mr. Norn had made a couple of days ago during the proceedings, and uh, I think you were aware of that. I'm just wondering if you wanted to make that, you're going to make the application and whether you'd like to deal with that now? Uh, if you're referring, sir, to the um, the comments that were included in the chat component of the uh, the procedure or the proceedings that we're watching on Zoom, and people may not realize that uh, we're conducting the uh, examination, the inquiry entirely on Zoom, uh, and that the, the 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 vast majority of people are watching on YouTube. So they would not have had access to uh, to the chat comments that were being made, but um, they were certainly, in some instances, read out. And we wanted to. We're, we're we're not opposed to having that matter dealt with as part of the inquiry. And I'm referring specifically to what we can uh, internally identify as uh, as um, 18 A, B, and C. Is that what we're talking about, sir? Because there was more than one instance. Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I just wanted to make sure we weren't revisiting that which had already been dispensed with. No. Um, and uh, just in my own notes, there was the statement made in, in respect to the sole adjudicator about the uh, my judgment that it was like a legal farce. There was a suggestion to Mr. Ollie Williams that, that he was, I think the phrase, he was a liar. And there were also uh, some statements involving uh, this. Was, I would characterize them as antagonistic statements towards Mr. LaPrairie. Those are the three items, sir, that uh, that are before the inquiry. And uh, if you're telling me that you're not going to be making application, then they're before us. Uh, no, sir. Um, uh, what I intend to do after consultation with my client uh, in compliance with uh, the consent to discuss this particular and one other issue that uh, came up this morning with my client, uh, we do intend to uh, um, agree that they are properly before you. They're part of the transcript and um, I would propose simply to examine my client with respect to those matters. Uh, and just to be clear, sir, um, <clears throat> Uh, Mr. LaPrairie has uh, correctly identified portions of the transcript in which these comments appear and I propose to deal with them um, chronologically and uh, if that's agreeable sir I would just begin my my crossing. Yeah, I don't have any problem with that I just wanted to make sure on the record that you're not making a, an application to exclude the evidence and uh, so we, you go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. And uh, as I indicated, uh, so Mr. Norn, you're on mute and you have your hand up. <laughs> uh, my apologies. I have, have like maybe 15, 20 seconds. I just got to deal with my pet. It was making a lot of noise close to me and I was trying to mute and it. it's kind of dis distracting for me. So if, I, if you don't mind, if I just could have your indulgence here briefly. What is it? Is this a pet? Yeah, just a pet. <laughs> Should bring my two cats in. <laughs> as long as nobody appears on the screen behind a cat filter, we're we're doing okay. <laughs> I think for argument, Mr. Cooper, I have two cats, so I should bring them to the hearing. <laughs> well, I, 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 I should is... note, sir, that we have a trial scheduled, a uh, Nunavu trial that uh, is scheduled to be entirely remotely, and um, the case management uh, justice specifically said that she wants to ensure that there are no screaming babies or barking dogs in the backyard, which is not all that easy when so many of us are operating out of our homes. Thank you. 
<laughs> okay, my apologies, I'm back. Okay, Mr. Norn, um, I just want to carry on with my examination of you first by dealing with some matters that uh, were raised by Mr. LaPrairie as matters of concern. Um, as we discussed uh, before the hearing today, the comments were <coughs> in the record at uh, page one, uh, lines two, and then thereafter lines 19 and 20. Uh, you were recorded in the transcript as saying, Mr. LaPrairie, I don't want to hear your voice. Mr. Barclay, you were saying something. Further down that page is indicated at uh, line 18, 19, and 20. Mr. LaPrairie, I don't want to hear your voice. Stop talking, it's my turn to talk. Page three, line six, Mr. Norn is recorded as saying, you are recorded as saying, you're very good at interrupting Mr. LaPrairie. Further down at line 16, page three, can you guys like not get your crap together seriously? On page five, you're recorded in the transcript as saying, are you serious Mr. Barclay, seriously? That's at line 18 and at line 21. You're recorded as saying, wow, wow, at line 26 on page five. This is like a farce. This is a legal farce, seriously. Page 31 of the transcript. Just a question for the adjudicator. I know, oh, I'm sorry, that, <laughs> yeah, that was uh, Mr. Williams referring to uh, the comment that uh, appeared in the Zoom chat. Uh, in which Mr. Norn uh, had typed in the word liar. Mr. Norn, you acknowledge you made those those comments by writing them in the chat feature of the Zoom program? That's correct. And can you give us some insight into what you intended by making those comments? Yeah, um, first off, I want to apologize uh, to Mr. Bar uh, Mr. Barclay, Mr. LaPerry, it's this is me normally in my normal demeanor when I do my business as an elected official, and at the time I felt like I needed I needed some time away from this whole process because I wanted to look after my family, and I just felt I wasn't given the opportunity to. Um, and you know, when I get when I get elected to got elected to office, I'm, I was here because you know I'm a passionate person. I I do my job with with my heart, um, and you know uh, during this the beginning part of the process of this, it was I was stressed beyond belief. You know, I was worried about my family and and to have this inquiry uh, proceed as it did at the at the time, I felt it was. Um, you know, it was little time, but like I said, I said I, well, no matter what, if we're if we're called, if we're subpoenaed, I realize now that you know we still have to respect legal processes and and um, but I want to apologize for my tone and uh, on Tuesday and uh, like I said, it was un, it was out of character for me and uh, um, regrettable. When you say that this is your normal demeanor or how you deal with business, you're referring to how you're responding now. You're not re you're not referring to how you reacted on Tuesday. I take it. Yeah, well, you, you, you'll see me on the record. Like when I'm in in the house, I I like I, I speak from the heart always, and uh, you know um, we there's a certain like I said there's certain decorums we have to follow. We have to follow processes, and and that's what I've always done. You know even. As far back when I was a you know police officer, I was taught that to respect the rule of law and to to remember that because I even remember as my time in F Division of Saskatchewan, I you know I drove around uh, the legal teams and and the judges and knowing that the the tough schedules they have, I know what their job is about and 
uh, you know, I was proud there to 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 be by their side and and guide them around. Um, I, I even helped uh, interpret, you know, for sometimes in in North Saskatchewan to help out. Um, I did that. I did that with pride and. I don't know. Uh, to be on this side of of things is just a, an unusual process. That, uh, unusual for me. Like I, I didn't expect to. You know, I went throughout life, you know, not to be on this on on this side of things. Um, so, how are you feeling on Tuesday when you type those things into the chat box? Well, seeing my daughter struggle and knowing I couldn't, knowing my mom was in not in good shape. I just uh, like my mind was not there. Um, just uh, I was my mind was on them. Uh, my mind was on my family. And how were you feeling when you made those pronouncements on the record, in reference to uh, the, the process and Mr. La Prairie? Just I felt like I was just uh, yeah I, I it was felt like I was under attack and just it just it felt unjust at the time, but you know looking back now it just. Everybody was just doing their jobs, and uh, I need to. Uh, I just I didn't see that time. I like, uh, like I said, I felt I should have been excused that day to take care of my family, but it it is what it is now, and um, I understand that I had to be there no matter what. Okay, thank you, Mr. Norn. Uh, uh, another development, um, as you know now, is we received this morning. A uh, short email thread between yourself and Glenn Rutland with Nicole Bunnell copied on each of the emails. And you had a chance to read that over? I did. Okay. Now, um, previously, Mr. LaPrairie, you were entering all of the exhibits. I don't know where we are in the scheme of things, but I'm going to ask that the email thread that you provided to us at seven o'clock this morning be entered as the next exhibit it's exhibit 37 thank you sir now mr norn um I, I i take it that you recall this particular email thread between yourself and mr rutland uh, dated at the top uh, april 22nd 2021 at 1108 p.m uh, sorry, but myself between myself and Glenn Rutman, twenty twenty one p.m. No, April twenty second, twenty twenty one, at eleven o eight p.m. Eleven o eight. I see slightly different timelines, but uh, I could be wrong here. Um, if you look at the very top of the thread, there's, there's yes. two times on here. Oh, who are I replied at eleven o eight. Yes, yes. Okay, now I see it. Okay, yep. so. Contained in that exhibit is two pages. The, the, the first in time of the communications you'll see is 10.35 p.m. from Mr. Rutland to you and copy to Nicole Bunnell. Do you see that? I do, yes. And then you responded at 11.08 p.m. Same That's day. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to pay due regard to uh, our lone Chippewaian interpreter and read this as slowly as I can. The first of the two communications reads from Glenn Rutland with his email address, date Thursday, April 22, 2021, 10.35 p.m., to Steve Norn with your assembly address, copy to Nicole Bunnell at her assembly address, subject draft statement for review. Mr. Norn, here is a draft statement for review. We can look at sending it out or sending it to Joanne Stassen at CBC once you have reviewed and approved it and indicated how you want to distribute it. New paragraph. I have prepared the statement below based on our conversation this evening. It is important that all information in the statement be correct and accurate, as I expect the media will be reviewing it closely 
and seeking to confirm all of the facts. Please let us know if anything needs to be changed. New paragraph. Please call me if you have any questions or wish to discuss, but please confirm approval of the statement by email. New paragraph, thanks. New paragraph, Glenn Rutland. Now immediately following that is the following, what I understand to be the draft statement or press release. Mr. Steve Norn, the MLA for Tu Nede Willede, has released the following statement. I have chosen to identify myself as the positive COVID test result this week. The second confirmed test announced today is a member of my family and a self-isolating new paragraph. I traveled by car to Alberta in response to a family emergency. I left the Northwest Territories on Thursday, April 1, 2021, and returned on Sunday, April 4, 2021, crossing the border in the late afternoon slash early evening. New paragraph. I filed a self-isolation plan on April 1, 2021 as required, identifying that I would isolate at home. New paragraph. On the evening of Monday, April 19, 2021, the Chief Public Health Officer identified that wastewater testing had identified the presence of the COVID-19 virus in Yellowknife and asked that any person who was self-isolating or self-monitoring from April 14-17, 2021 get tested. New paragraph. As I was self-isolating on those days, I went and had a COVID-19 test on Tuesday, April 20, 2021. The next day, on Wednesday, April 21, 2021, I was notified by public health that I had tested positive for COVID-19 and immediately returned to self-isolation. New paragraph. I want to thank all of the health professionals at the Department of Health and Social Services and the Northwest Territories Health and Social Services Authority for their work in keeping us safe. New paragraph. Given my role, I have chosen to identify myself. However, I do ask that people respect my family's privacy as we move forward. Do you recognize the contents of that part of the email thread? Uh, I do. Okay, and it's consistent with your recollection that doesn't appear to have been any changes or modifications? Yeah, I was, yeah, like I said before, through this whole little time frame, like for that, that week, but like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday was exhausting. Um, but I still went, I still threw, like I was, yeah, I was really tired when that uh, email went through. Okay. And then you responded... As I said previously, at 11.08 p.m., that's the top part of the thread, but later chronologically, and it reads, from Steve Norn, sent April 22, 2021, at 11.08 p.m., to Glenn Rutland, copy to Nicole Bunnell, subject re-draft statement for review. Hello, Glenn, new paragraph. Great job, guys. Approved. Make sure to add that I was not showing any symptoms when I completed my isolation. New paragraph, regards, new paragraph, Steve. Is that an accurate recitation of your response to Mr. Rutland on April 22nd? Yes. Now, I understand that you spoke to Mr. Rutland the day before, April 21st, a Wednesday. Yeah, I did. And you told him at that time that you had spoken to the Premier and that you had been diagnosed with COVID-19 as of April 21st, correct? Correct. Now, the following day, I understand that you were speaking to Mr. Rutland and his staff, particularly Nicole Bunnell, about 
putting out a press release. Yes. Uh, um, just to correct, I remember I thought I was talking to Danielle Mager, but uh, I know that Nicole Bonnell works under Danielle Mager, so I, I'm sure she was aware of it as well. But um, now I remember Nicole, yes. When you spoke to Mr. Rutland on Thursday, April 22nd, he let you know that he knew that you had been at the legislature building on August 20, on August 17th, correct? Correct. Did he tell you that he had already been informed by the sergeant at arms earlier that day on the 22nd? Of, uh, I don't know that I, information. I don't know about that. Yeah, In your uh, conversation, sorry, go ahead. In your conversations with Mr. Rutland, uh, let me back up. How many times did you speak with Mr. Rutland on April 22nd in reference to the press release or otherwise? Uh, I don't recall. I think we call, talked a, a couple times, uh, but mostly it was through email. Did Mr. Rutland disclose to you during those calls that he knew that you had been at the Legislative Assembly on the 17th? Oh, I don't recall. Um... Like I said, it was just like this whole little time period was a blur, but I, I don't remember at that time. Did, did Mr. Rutland identify for you that he had already contacted public health and spoken to nurse Stephanie Gilbert on the 22nd? I, I don't know about that conversation, no. Do you recall Mr. Rutland suggesting to you that you should put into the press release that you had in fact visited the legislature on April 17th? No, I don't uh, remember saying that, no. Do you remember talking to Mr. Rutland at all about that visit on your visit of the 17th when you were speaking to him on April 22nd? No, I don't recall. Do you recall if Mr. Rutland called you after your interview with Cabin Radio on Friday, April 23rd? We may have. I, I, uh, um, Mr. Rutland would probably best, best answer that. I'm hmm? oh, sorry. My stomach's not well. Sorry, are we pausing? Uh, I, I'm just consulting with uh, with my associate, Mr. Oh. Alonfi. Just just give us one minute. We don't need to to adjourn or pause. Sir, uh, back on. Um, sir, rather than um, just having everybody stare at us speaking, if we can just have a couple of minutes. I think I'm done with Mr. Norn, but uh, I, I don't want to... take five him. minutes and it'll give the interpreter a little rest then. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you, sir. This hearing is adjourned for a brief recess.
Mr. Norris. Mr. Cooper. I'm not sure why, uh, sir, but uh, the Regina camera has gotten very pixelated. It doesn't really affect what we're doing, but um, just just a, a note. I don't know why that is. It's all been very clear until this moment. In any event, um, uh, Mr. Norn, if you can unmute, please. I just have one more question for you. Um, okay. yeah. Mr. Halabi correctly pointed out that the one thing I hadn't clarified with you is who drafted most of the press release that I just read into the record? Uh, good question. Uh, probably, uh, I'm going to say Nicole Bonnell, but I think Mr. Rutland would uh, better answer that. Okay, but, but I guess a better question would be uh, how much of the press release that I just read into the record did you draft? A good portion of it, like uh, most, like like the timelines and stuff, were most of me. And there's like the, some, like I said, most some grammar that were corrected by the staff. And I think the last, if I could just go back and refer to that again, uh, bear with me. Um, no, that's okay, Mr. Norn. You don't you don't need to be looking at evidence right now. Just listen to the question and answer, please. Okay. Okay. Just focus on me. Okay. So from your recollection. Okay. How much of the press release was drafted by you? How much was drafted by Mr. Rutland's office? I'm going to say probably I had probably, if I had to put a percentage on it, probably 60-40, me 60-40 uh, being the uh, Mr. Rutland's office, the clerk's office. Um, were, you, were you given any, to your recollection, direction as to what should be in and what should not be in that press release? Um. Uh, just some of it. Just uh, I remember being told just to make sure to just to make sure you got the timelines right because it would be scrutinized and uh, that that much I remember. Um, and um, I do remember asking uh, saying that you know I was not having any symptoms at the time. I and um, I think that was left out. Did Did Mr. Rutland offer any critique or criticism? of the final draft that he sent to you before it was released? No, just uh, just that uh, the warning to make sure that it was factual and to the point and that was probably the gist of it. And who actually took care of releasing the press release? Was that something that you or your assistants did or was that something the clerk's office did? The clerk's office handle all that. Uh, they're the ones that ultimately sign off on the releases from anything from the ledges signed off by them. I yeah. When you say signed off, what what do you understand that to uh, to mean? Well, I mean we handle most of our uh, press releases, but uh, you know when it something leaves from the ledge with the uh, ledge letterhead, um, oh sorry, legislative assembly letterhead, usually it's, it's the, they um, they have the they have the, they have a say in it, I guess. Um, ultimately, and you've anticipated what I was asking my colleague, which is the press release in its final form came out on NWT legislature letterhead, correct? Yes. And was it the clerk's office or somebody at the legislature, other than you or your staff, that decided who received the press release? Who in the media? Yeah, I, I didn't make any of those decisions. No. Was there any follow-up by Mr. Rutland or his staff in reference to how to deal with the press release after it was released? Oh, I just, yeah, you refreshed my memory with the CBC being referenced uh, the, to send that out first, but after that, I think they said they were going to do some more the next day because just because of the, the late hour, I think. So Mr. Mr. Rutland's office said that they were going to do more press releases the next day? From what I recall, yes. And did uh, Mr. Rutland or his staff indicate to you what the the nature of those press releases would be? Uh, I don't remember. I don't recall. Do you remember being presented with any other press releases after April 21st, before the end of the month? The, you're, you're the 21st, you said? Were you, were you presented with any press releases other than the one that I've just read into the record? No. No, not that I recall, no. Were there any other press releases suggested to you by anybody at the clerk's office after the press release that was issued on April 23rd? 
So you can, can you repeat the question? Were there any other press releases that the clerk's office recommended that you approve after the press release of April 23rd? No, no, I don't remember ever seeing any other uh, drafts. No. But did anybody suggest to you that maybe you should put out some more press releases on legislature letterhead after the 23rd? No, not that I recall, no. Thank you, sir. Those are all of my, my questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Cooper. Mr. LaPre, do you have any nominations? Just a few uh, questions, Mr. Norn. Um, when you were speaking to Mr. Rutland on April 22nd, uh, did you identify to him that your isolation period was April 4th to the 18th? Oh. Or do you question. remember? I don't, I don't recall. No, I just, the main thing, I, I know that when we talked around that time was, I told him, yeah, I talked to the premier and I want to let you know that uh, I tested positive for, for COVID around that time. And uh, we had a brief conversation and I said, I'm going to isolation. And then I, did another, I had another conversation the next day. Okay, again, on, on April 22nd, um, do you recall saying, to Mr. Rutland uh, that you wanted to say something in the media statement that you had followed the rules? Uh, I don't recall. Uh, Mr. Rutland would better answer that. Okay. Uh, but Mr. Rutland said that you could not say that because you had been on to the legislature on the 17th and that you could not assert in the press release that you complied with your plan because of the visit to the assembly. Oh, on the yeah. 17th. Yeah, yeah, this, um, not the case, yes. Uh, so around this time, like I said, I mentioned before, like when I talked to Mr. Rutland, I said, they, I followed, yeah, I felt I followed all the rules. So I followed all the rules that put whatever I said on the record before. And he said, well, no, yeah, you went to the, you went to the lead, we have, like we, have video footage of you that's yeah that's what uh, that's how that conversation went down yes okay so have i stated it correctly then yes now uh, the next day, April 23rd, after the cabin radio article uh, came out, um, do you recall having a conversation with Mr. Rutland about that article? Oh, darn. I don't, I don't recall. Okay. Well, did you... Do you recall uh, Mr. Norn, uh, Mr. Rutland telling you that what you said in the Cabin Brady article was wrong because you had gone to the legislature on the 17th? Yeah, okay, yes, I do remember, I remember having that conversation, yes. Okay, and okay, no, yeah. that Mr. Rutland asked you if you would like to issue another press release changing your earlier press release. Oh, darn. Or do you recall? I don't recall. I don't recall that. Okay. Those are all the questions I have. Thank you. Mr. Norton, your testimony is concluded. Thank you. Merci, and uh, the the next witness, she would, yeah, she uh, we need five minutes to arrange the next witness, which will be uh, Sheila McPherson. Sheila McPherson. We'll just take a five minute break, and then she will be put on the stand. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. This hearing is adjourned for five minutes.
Thank you. Mr. Cooper, before you uh, start your examination of Ms. McPherson, I just wanted to confirm with you when, when we had the argument over the subpoena, I think it was clear that the evidence that you wanted to elicit from Ms. McPherson was about how a first a new first year term MLA would have been taught about the member's code of conduct, how to deal with the crisis, how to approach the media, and how to deal with media inquiries. So I'm just gently caution you that your examination should be restricted to that, to that area and I'll let you proceed. The, the caution is heard, sir. I, I do intend to um, I explore how the relationship uh, with Ms. McPherson and uh, the clerk's office evolved over the same period of time um, as I've talked to uh, some of the other witnesses. I, I won't be going into anything um, that predicated the initial subpoena request. So I, I, I trust that I won't be covering any ground that hasn't already been covered from different no, perspectives. No, and I think uh, in, in my, my judgment, I, I, I dealt with what was happening in the clerk's office and made it pretty clear that uh, that evidence is not uh, related to the terms of reference and uh, that's why I didn't issue the subpoena. In any event, your experience, counsel, and I've, I've given you my I, I, I'm sure. I'm sure I will be uh, corrected and, and appropriately admonished if I unintentionally cross the line, but the areas of examination, a um, little unusual being this up front with uh, the witness before we start, but she's also experienced counsel, not a lot of surprises that uh, I, I have for her. But I, I do want to be clear, sir, that uh, consistent with the other evidence that has been discussed, um, I have no intention and will not be exploring uh, anything leading up to um, the appointment of the, or the establishment of the inquiry or anything like that, but rather just talking about the evolution of the, um, the, the support that, that my, my, my client was getting over uh, the relevant period of time. And, and, and I don't think that that will have correction. Thank you, sir. So, uh, Ms. McPherson? Mr. Cooper? Um, very much uh, my pleasure to speak with you today. Now, um, why don't we start with a little bit of your background? Excuse me, Mr. Cooper. Uh, she hasn't been sworn yet. Oh, I'm sorry. That's correct. Ms. Anderson? Please state your name in full. Sheila Marlene McPherson. Are, are we swearing or affirming, ma'am? Um, I don't have access to a Bible, so I would prefer to affirm. Thank you. Do you solemnly affirm, Ms. McPherson, that, that the evidence that you shall provide today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Okay, well, let's start again. Thank you for that uh, correction, counsel. Um, just a bit of background, Ms. McPherson, just to, you want to hit some highlights and tell us... Uh, for uh, Mr. Barclay's uh, benefit, a little bit about the person to whom I'm speaking. All right. Give hey. us a little bit of background. I, I mean, I can draw it out if you question my question, but <laughs> I think you know what I'm looking for. And if you can just bring us there in a summary form, it'll save some time. Certainly, um, Mr. Cooper, happy to do so. I'm law clerk to the Legislative Assembly. I've been involved with the Legislative Assembly since 1988. Um, in a variety of different capacities, um, most primarily in the role as legal counsel to the Legislative Assembly. In that role, I provide advice to the Speaker, the Board of Management, uh, individual MLAs, um, committees of MLAs, and staff at the Legislative Assembly. When you say you're legal counsel, I understand that you carry the title of law clerk to the Legislative Assembly? That's correct. And have you had the title law clerk since 1988? Um, no, I was deputy law clerk in 1988. I believe I became the law clerk in 1991. Um, I carried that till the year 2000, became law clerk again in 2007, and have fairly continuously been law clerk since that period of time, except for two brief occasions where I uh, attempted to transition that role to other people uh, in contemplation of, uh, of retiring at some point out of this role. Um, and I am? I am a uh, law clerk today. Okay. 
I understand you share at least one title with Mr. LaPrairie as the past president of the Federation of Law Societies of Canada. Is that right? That's correct. I, I take it, Ms. McPherson, um, you're not a civil servant in the ordinary description. You work for, for an outside law firm and you're contracted to perform the duties that you've just described. Is that right? Yes. Uh, we're having some technical difficulties here. You've frozen. I don't know if anybody else is getting a feed. I'm sorry, we didn't hear your answer. Uh, you froze. Oh, I'm sorry it did. Uh, it seemed all good at my end. Um, yes, that's correct. I am uh, uh, in private practice. Uh, I'm a partner at a law firm. In okay, and that distinguishes you from your role or the role that Mr. Rutland has in that he is actually employed by the Legislative Assembly, I understand. That's right. Okay, you work with Mr. Rutland and Mr. Mercer, for example, in the sort of providing the sort of services that you've just described. That's correct. And I understand, Mr. Mc, uh, Ms. McPherson, that you are involved in the orientation of new MLAs as they, they come into the legislature. Um, and that's correct, Mr. Cooper. Um, a number of individuals are involved in the orientation of new MLAs. As I'm sure um, you can appreciate, it's a, uh, it's a significant task um, and a very important task. Um, that the staff at the MO, at, that the staff at the Legislative Assembly uh, take very seriously. Uh, this orientation for the 19th Assembly was particularly key given the large number of new members, indeed the unprecedented number of new members that we had at the Legislative Assembly. So considerable care was taken, uh, was taken with respect to the orientation. I uh, was involved with the orientation of new members, uh, but so were quite a few other individuals within the assembly and indeed outside of the assembly. Was it your recollection that the orientation was modified at all to reflect the large number of new MLAs as opposed to the, the previous collection of new MLAs? I don't have any specific recollection of that, but what I can indicate is to the best of my recollection, it was the most lengthy uh, and comprehensive orientation that I can recall in the decades that I've served the assembly. Um, the orientation lasted for a three-week period. Um, and then there was also a second orientation a few weeks later that was aimed specifically at new MLA. So it was a fairly, fairly significant endeavor. And to the best of my recollection, it was probably the most comprehensive orientation that the Assembly has ever delivered. What topics in particular, Ms. McPherson, did you cover in your capacity as law clerk orienting the MLAs? Um, I reviewed some of the orientation material in advance of um, the, or, the actual orientation itself. For example, the member's code of conduct was something that the members received a, a comprehensive orientation on. They, um, they were specifically oriented, I believe, by Glenn Rutland and possibly Tim Mercer, but I reviewed the materials uh, in relation to that orientation prior to uh, the members receiving that orientation. I did not attend that specific orientation session, um, but because I reviewed the materials, I'm aware of the degree of, of detail that went into orienting new, M new and, and returning MLAs on the code of conduct. Um, I was also involved in orienting MLAs um, on issues around residency and their capital cost or capital accommodation benefits. One of the specific tasks of a law clerk is to meet individually with each member and um, obtain from them information with respect to their residency so as to allow members to swear a statutory declaration as to whether they are entitled to receive accommodation in the LNA. So that is a, a specific task that um, that I undertake 
with each new assembly and uh, with each elected in my life. Um, other portions of the orientation that I would have been involved in uh, relate really to assisting the members in knowing what we do as law clerks to the assembly. In addition to myself, there's a deputy law clerk, so members have access to to a variety of the Sorry, you you frozen again. I don't know if you can hear me, but uh, Ms. McPherson, you you're gonna have to go back. Um, I think the last clear statement I heard is you made reference to the deputy law clerk, to which the MLAs also have recourse. That's correct. And sorry about that. I'm not sure why the connection is not solid. Um, uh, in addition to to myself, members also have access to a deputy law clerk. Um, so we have two people who support members in terms of legal issues. Um, so I orient members on the role of the law clerk, what we can do for members, um, the limits upon what we can do for members, and then provide them generally with a sense of, of comfort um, that they can approach me or the deputy law clerk at any time on issues that relate to their duties as an MLA. I hope you got that, Mr. Cooper. Uh, thank you for that uh, that answer, uh, Ms. McPherson. What specifically were the MLAs, particularly the, the new MLAs, told that they could come to you for assistance upon, or the deputy law clerk, as the case may be? The essential element of what members are allowed to use um, the law clerk services for, or that generally they have to relate to the performance of their duties as a MLA. Um, so for example, if a member has a question on a bill that is before the House or that the government intends on introducing, a member can come to me and ask me for assistance and in explaining the bill, how it might relate to other pieces of legislation, what legislation might look like across the country um, in this particular area. Um, so that would be one common example of, of what I would explain to members that they can access legal resources for. Um, other things are that members may have issues with their constituents. Um, this constituents may approach them with a problem about for example, legal aid, and I will assist the member in directing them to the proper resource within government or to explaining uh, to the member some of the information that they might want to provide to their constituents uh, so as to allow members to better discharge their duties um, in representing uh, their constituents. Um, they may also have questions about um, who does what within the assembly. Um, what is the distinction between my role, for example, and the role of researchers within the assembly? And I will assist them on that. But there are times that members will come to me um, and sometimes have personal issues that they want to discuss. And, and uh, what we don't do is provide personal legal um, as assistance to members, um, because obviously that's outside of the scope of, of a um, the role of law clerk, we have to be very careful that the assistance that we provide to members is is in their capacity as members, not personally. Um, but I will often sort of say you might want to go and see A, B, or C about that particular issue. Um, we are present during session. I tell members that we're present during session. We have office hours and that our door is always open and that they can feel free to approach me. And so that's the information and support that we provide to individual members. Um, I will also be involved in supporting individual members on private members' bills or amendments to government bills that are before the House. Um, so there's, there's a fair bit of, of legal support that's provided by myself and my deputy to members. And I make it very clear to members that when we're not in the Assembly, um, that they can approach me at uh, my office downtown at any time. And indeed, we try to be fairly responsive to to members, and I can indicate that it's not uncommon to to respond to requests for assistance at, at uh, 
at uh, hours that aren't strictly nine to five, as I'm sure you can appreciate. My understanding, Ms. McPherson, and, and to your credit, that you in particular are seen as a bit of a clearinghouse for MLAs who have a variety of problems, personal and political, but don't really know where to go. But would you agree with that characterization of your role as it is now, maybe not as it was intended or written? It's clearinghouse because it suggests that there's a, a defined role and that a member has to I'm go. I'm sorry to interrupt, but Ms. McPherson, we're I having trouble hearing you. Oh. Thank you. All right. Maybe what I'll, I'll, I'll get a little bit closer. Um, the setup's not optimal. <laughs> Um, That's much I'm, better. <laughs> I'm I'm not sure I would describe it as a as a clearinghouse because that suggests that members have to approach um, our office or me before uh, accessing other resources. But it is not uncommon, given the location of our office physically within the assembly, where we're located in the area where MLAs have their offices. It's not uncommon for somebody to pop by and say, I'm struggling with this. Do you have any advice on this? Or uh, can you direct me in the right direction to deal with issue A, B, or C? And, and that's a common occurrence. I wouldn't say it's a daily occurrence, but it happens from time to time, yes. And you understand that because of your longevity, don't take that word the wrong way, in the Legislative Assembly, that you're seen as somebody upon whom MLAs new and old can rely for information. You understand that role? I'm not sure I, I can speak to how other people perceive me, uh, but I can indicate that I do my best to be approachable and of assistance. You understand, though, that MLAs rely upon you for advice not strictly within your job description? I do. And you're perceived by the MLAs as somebody who is knowledgeable and reliable in that regard? Again, I can't speak to how other people perceive me. I would hope that I am perceived as such. Okay, but but Ms. McPherson, you, you've received comments from others suggesting that here that that Sheila McPherson is knowledgeable, she's reliable. You know that people are saying that about you, correct? I do. Okay. And on some occasions you reach out proactively to MLAs to address a problem that they haven't even approached you with, correct? I'm, I'm not sure about that. Um, I can't recall specifically right at the moment where I might have reached out to somebody to discuss an issue that they haven't approached with me. I mean, there oh. are there perhaps if I might elaborate. There are times, for example, something might get raised in a committee meeting, an MLA will ask a question, and I'll I'll talk to them afterwards and say. By the way, you might want to think about that. So I suppose that is proactively reaching out. Um, they haven't come to me, but I've been at the committee meeting and and then discussed afterwards with them the question that they had or the issue that they had raised. So, so that certainly happens from time to time, yeah. When you see an MLA doing something that you're concerned about, has it not been your experience that you reach out to them and make suggestions? No, <laughs> no, it, it very much depends on what the issue is. Um, if, if, as I said, if, if I'm in, in a meeting and, and I see something occur um, or a member have a question or seem confused about something, I, I will absolutely try to be of assistance afterwards. I'll, I'll go up to them and, and try to assist them. Sure. I, I, Sorry, go ahead. I, I wouldn't necessarily consider it part of my duty to sort of 
reach out if if I'm concerned about something because those people people have personal lives. I, I'm thinking more in terms of of their duties as MLAs. When you see an MLA speak to the media or or do something in the legislative assembly that you, you that causes you concern. Has it not been your experience that you will reach out to offer them advice and assistance? No. No. A little How bit uncertain you? about what you mean by causes me concern. My 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 role is not to monitor the behavior of MLAs or or to try to regulate it necessarily. Did you at any point reach out to Mr. Norn and suggest that you had concerns about, for example, his, his press release? No. Did you express those concerns to anybody in the clerk's office? No. How would you describe your interaction with other members at the clerk's office, Mr. Rutland, Mr. Mercer, other individuals that work under Mr. Mercer's umbrella? Uh, currently, currently, Mr. Uh, Robinson's umbrella. Um, collegial, uh, professional. Um, we are colleagues. I, I think we have an amazing team at the assembly. Um, I value the work that the people do a great deal. I respect the work that they do. Um, so I would I would describe it as a very collegial, respectful, professional work relationship. And do you coordinate your activities with respect to the assistance, advice, and guidance that you give to the MLAs? Uh, that's a pretty broad question. Um, my typical experience is when, when we're in session, uh, I will typically touch base regularly, daily with the clerk's office to get a sense of what's on the agenda, what uh, the House is doing in committee of the whole, are bills up, um, are there any legal issues which have arisen out of uh, ordinary members' caucus or any procedural issues that, that may have a legal implication to them. So I'll reach out often to the clerk's office at the beginning of the day to get a sense of what uh, the day will look like. Um, so in that degree, there is, or in that regard, there is a degree of coordination. Um, I'm not sure I coordinate with the clerk's office the interactions that I have with MLAs. Those interactions can be quite spontaneous um, and largely occur when MLAs are going to and from either the house or committee meetings, um, so so there is a degree with, of coordination with the clerk's office in terms of the business of the house and the committees. Um, but with respect to projects that I may be working with on individual MLAs um, or issues that they may raise with me, those aren't necessarily coordinated through the clerk's office. Is there any sort of coordination between what you do and the premier's office? Very rarely. Very rarely, um, most of the work I would do is with the regular members. Um, on occasion, there can be some coordination with the Premier's office um, on issues that may involve both Cabinet and ordinary members uh, or regular members uh, jointly, but that's a fairly rare, a fairly rare event. In the orientation sessions that you participate in or are aware of, is there any information and advice on crisis management for the MLAs? The MLAs um, were provided with media training. Um, that's that's one aspect, I suppose, of dealing with crisis management. Um, for the 19th Assembly, the MLAs had two media sessions. Um, they had a breakfast with members of the local media, um, uh, just really a bit of a meet and greet so that they could get to know who is covering the week. 
Um, so that occurred during the three-week orientation period um, that I spoke of earlier. In addition, the MLAs were provided with a full-day session um, on media training, essentially. I understand that that session was run by an outside contractor um, and involved such things as how to deal with media requests, um, how to get one's message out effectively, how to do a proper interview, um, and also uh, the session also. We lost you again. <laughs> Sorry, uh, uh, Mr. First, we lost, we, we lost you again mm -hmm. there for a moment. Um, uh, just, just maybe if you can back, back up uh, 30 seconds. <laughs> sure, okay. The, as I indicated, there were two media sessions that were provided to members in the most recent orientation. The first was a media breakfast, the meet and greet. The second was a full day media training session that was coordinated or run by an outside consultant. Um, and that involved providing MLAs with information and briefing on how to effectively work with the media, how to get their message out, how to address interview requests, um, and even entailed the members going through mock media interviews and being videotaped and then getting feedback from um, from uh, the part from the coordinator of the course on how they did during the media interview, somewhat like a trial advocacy course, which I know you're familiar with, um, really so that the members get a sense of comfort, or perhaps if not entirely a sense of comfort, a greater sense of comfort in dealing with the media than they might otherwise have. And that was um, was uh, a full day session that was offered to the all of the members during the orientation of members of the 19th assembly what about in the instance of let me back up most of the new mlas i take it were fairly new to the public spotlight in terms of the intensity with which the media uh, would be looking at their behavior is that a fair statement based on the 19th assembly there were a lot of new MLAs. Um, as I indicated, it was an unprecedented number of new MLAs, and typically um, most people entering uh, politics at that level would be unlikely, in my experience, to have had considerable experience in dealing with the media. Was there any specific advice or instruction of which you are aware in terms of what to do when you make a mistake? when you make a mistake in the Legislative Assembly, when you make a mistake with a constituent, when you make a mistake with the media. Was there any advice or instruction with respect to that scenario? That's a, a really broad question. Um, I wasn't present for the media training, so I can't speak to the specifics of, of what advice or information MLAs were offered in terms of misstepping in a, in a public way. Um, the whole topic of making a mistake is, I mean, it's, it's quite broad. We did have, as, as I indicated, um, orientation and training on, on the code of ethics um, that, uh, that was fairly in-depth and, and specifically recall that that orientation was delivered just prior to the members being sworn in. Um, because it is such a, a significant um, code, uh, significant both that members sign, uh, there was a real desire to ensure that members had access to that resource and, and that it was fresh in their mind. Members are also advised, and I heard um, Justice Barkley speak about his time, as I believe it was as, as Integrity Commissioner in Saskatchewan, um, members are also advised and receive a briefing from the NWT's Integrity Commissioner um, and are, are advised that they can approach him at any time for, for advice or support. In fact, highly, highly encouraged um, to reach out to the Integrity Commissioner um, at any time. We often will advise members um, that while I can give members an opinion on on um, conflict of interest issues. 
the real golden seal of approval is is reaching out to the integrity commissioner and having him deliver an advisory opinion to members as to how they should conduct themselves because that carries with it a degree of immunity from uh, from any allegation um, if you follow uh, the integrity commissioner's advice so there's there's a variety of different ways i think that members are provided with information about how they can carry out their job um, and what they might do if they have questions or need support. Another thing that is oh, and Will and his, afraid, I'm afraid you froze um, again there briefly. Um, I actually didn't hear, sorry, this is the court reporter. I didn't hear any of that answer. Oh dear, okay. Or sorry, can I just, Sorry. What, what, what's the last thing oh, that you sorry. reported, Madam Report? I did hear, sorry, I'm, that was my mistake. I did hear all of the answers. The last part I heard was, I'm just going to read it back. Um, okay. Um, so there's a variety of different ways that I think members are provided with information about how they can carry out their job and what they might do if they have questions or need support. Another thing that is, and then that's when the audio completely cut out. Thank you. I'm not sure if um, Madame uh, Reporter got the portion where I was talking about the role of the Integrity Commissioner and the support that is offered to members from him. Uh, yes, I did. I was just reading the last part of where you cut out. I didn't want to take up time by reading the entire answer. Right. I understand. I, I just wasn't sure about the order of, of what I said things. Yeah, and, sorry. Thanks. Um, okay. Uh, I think my last point was that during the orientation session, and indeed at any time, um, it is very much reinforced with members um, that the staff of the Office of the Clerk is there to assist them and that they can feel free to reach out to any member of the staff at just about any time in order to provide members with assistance. Um, and again, it is very, very common for for that reach out to not be limited to ordinary working hours, particularly during session, which is a very intense time for members. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Ms. McPherson. So my understanding is that just given the nature of politics, particularly in the North with, with consensus government, that the Legislative Assembly is a bit of a closed house. It's, it's much more difficult, I think you'd agree, for an MLA to reach out to somebody in the community when they're sitting in the Legislative Assembly as opposed to before or after. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? That when you're looking for assistance, you're more likely to turn inward than outward as an MLA. I suppose I would imagine every MLA would have their own support system and network, and many MLAs rely Quite substantially on people in their community to to tell them how they're doing and to provide them with advice and support. Um, certainly during session it is a very intense time uh, and it can sometimes be difficult I know for MLAs to to make those reach outs during session because they are so busy it's not uncommon for for meetings to start at seven in the morning and we go till routinely 8 30 9 o'clock at night so it is difficult for MLAs to to reach out um, during those very, very busy sessions. Um, and I would imagine then they're much more likely to, to seek some advice and support internally. But in my experience, many MLAs have quite strong um, support networks from their communities. Um, and that, that enriches, quite frankly, the the perspective that people have within the house because it provides a different perspective from from one outside of the bubble of the ledge. But there is a bit of a bubble that the MLAs operate within. I think you'd agree with that. Certainly, and and during session, um, during session, yes. And it's always been the case in your experience that the clerk's office, your office, the associated support structures are all very important for an MLA to carry out their roles. Yes. What information 
and resources are available to MLAs in terms of other support, uh, family issues, uh, drug or alcohol issues, mental health issues. What information are MLAs given in, in terms of that sort of support? The Assembly has a, um, a, a support program for MLAs. Um, there is, as, as there are for many people as well within the public sector, there is access to counseling, um, there's access to, to helplines, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. When MLAs are I'm sorry, Ms. McPherson, to interrupt again. Um, I hate to sound like a, or be like a mosquito, oh. but um, the last part of your answer that I got, I won't read the entire answer, but the assembly has a support program for MLAs. There is, there are for many people as well within the public sector. There is access to counseling. There is access to helplines, and then that's when your um, audio cut out. Thanks. I'm um, sure. Thank you. I will try to uh, perhaps be a bit louder. Um, yeah, I don't. I, I honestly, I don't mean to. I don't think that's the problem. There's a. It's a technical problem. It's got nothing to do with your volume. Right. I am going to when we complete this answer. So I'm going to suggest. Uh, it's not my suggestion. I'm passing it on. Uh, we take a short break. Allow Ms. McPherson to disconnect and reconnect, and that might actually enhance our our uh, bandwidth issue. Carry on, Ms. McPherson. Right. Thank you. Um, so MLAs have access to um, mental health resources, I guess, um, basically. And uh, over the years, um, I'm not uh, frequently involved in in that because those are highly personal issues. But I am aware from time to time, MLAs have accessed uh, mental health resources and uh, information about those resources is continually made available to MLAs. Uh, sir, I'm just going to suggest we take uh, maybe a break. The interpreter will probably appreciate it, but uh, it'll give Ms. McPherson an opportunity to uh, rejoin us, uh, hopefully with a more stable Thanks, connection. Cooper. We'll take a, we'll a five-minute adjournment. Okay. This hearing is now adjourned for five minutes.
Hearing is now resumed. Madam Clerk. Mr. Cooper. Uh, thank you, sir. I understand, uh, Ms. McPherson, that uh, Mr. Norn in particular had a, a good rapport with the clerk's office, with you, with everybody that was associated with the clerk's office, either as an employee <coughs> or yourself as an outside contractor. Would you agree with that characterization? Well, certainly from my perspective, um, I've spoken to Mr. Norn on a number of occasions um, and always had the sense that uh, the relationship was a, a good relationship. Thank you. And did you see that change in the earlier parts of this year, particularly I'm looking at April of this year? I think Mr. Norn's very public uh, comments about the office of the clerk were certainly... Um, concerning or certainly concerning and his his quite personal attacks um, were were worrisome um, so it can be very difficult to have somebody so publicly speak out about the office of the clerk in the fashion in which he did and still be friendly. Um, I, quite frankly, because I'm a bit of an outsider, I wasn't involved in the day-to-day -day dealings with that. Um, not with oh, so, so much for that theory. <laughs> Unfortunately, we, we lost you again. You said, unfortunately, <laughs> faded out. So if you can start from there, that would be great. Oh. Um, notwithstanding Mr. Norn's uh, public, uh, quite public criticism of, of the office of the clerk, my strong sense was that Mr. Norn always continued to receive access to the same degree of support and services. Um, as he had prior to April 2021. Um, so even though it's it's a little bit difficult uh, given how vocal he was in terms of his criticisms of the office of the clerk, he still had access and availed himself of the same range of services and support from those within the office of the clerk um, as he had prior to his quite public criticisms of the office. And that's despite, to use your term, um, matters becoming unfriendly. You know, that's a, not unfriendly. Mr. Mr. Norn levied very, very public accusations um, of, of a number of people within the office of the clerk. Uh, so I'm not quite sure unfriendly is the right word, um, but clearly it, it can be a bit of a challenging relationship. There's no doubt about it. Having said that, I was impressed with how much he continued to reach out and how much support Mr. Norn continued to receive in his day-to-day -day, um, work as an MLA. Do you agree with me, though, that however it manifested itself, the relationship that Mr. Norn had with the clerk's office deteriorated quite significantly in April of this year? I don't agree with that, Mr. Cooper. And your reference to the relationship turning unfriendly means what in this context, then? Um, that may not have been the best choice of words. I know that a number of people were concerned about the very public manner in which Mr. Norn chose to make his allegations about the office of the clerk in February of 2021. Notwithstanding that, he continued to receive um, services uh, from those within the office of the clerk. It is also my understanding that he actually had until relatively recently 
an excellent relationship with Glenn Rutland um, and reached out to him on a daily basis and on occasion uh, more frequently than a daily basis um, so that he he continued to have what I would describe as a professional and cordial relationship with Mr. Rutland and provided uh, who provided him with a great deal of service and support um, as did other members of the office of the clerk other staff members of the office of the clerk the relationship, as I understand it, though, uh, between the clerk's office, including you in that instance, and Mr. Norn was adversely impacted uh, in April and May of this year uh, as a result of him being admonished by you because of his comments and statements in public. Uh, I'm not aware of any admonishment that was directed at Mr. Norn and that you made it quite clear to him that you were quite angry with him for his behavior with respect to the statements being made in public. Are you speaking of my making it clear to Mr. Norton? Yes. No. No. What have others, to your knowledge, admonished Mr. Norton in reference to his public statements? I'm not aware of any admonishment that's been levied at Mr. Norn by those within the office of the clerk, Mr. Cooper. Um, and I certainly have not had any contact myself um, with Mr. Norn about these matters. Not in meetings at the Legislative Assembly? No. You were aware that there was a mediation and, and Mr. Norn made passing reference to it in his testimony of a mediation? Mr. Adjudicator, it's Toby Kruger here. Um, I'm just concerned we may be straying a little bit far from the three topics that uh, the uh, subpoena was intended to relate to, that being the onboarding of MLAs, how to deal with media, and, and how to uh, 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 the supports available to MLAs in a crisis. So uh, I, I just make that comment. Thank you. I think the point is well taken. Mr. Cooper, I caution you Gently, when we started the cross-examination, I did issue a subpoena, but on the distinct understanding, and I described your mandate at that time, and I don't think we should be getting into the, it's been described sometime as the toxic atmosphere in the, uh, in, in the clerk's office. It really has nothing to do with this hearing, and I've already uh, delivered a lengthy judgment on that regard, so if I kindly that you get back to the purpose for the cross-examination. <laughs> well, if I, if I may, sir, before you make any uh, final decision on that, I'm not referring I'm to the you, toxic... I'm giving you a lot of leeway, but just... Uh, I, I, I'm uh, only focusing... I'm sir, I'm only focusing on exactly what I said I would at the beginning of my examination of Ms. McPherson, which was the deterioration of the relationship. I'm not talking about the clerk's office per se, but rather the relationship that had developed or deteriorated in April, to a certain extent, the beginning of May last year. And the fact that there was, my understanding, a mediation in reference to that relationship it is part and parcel of that deterioration. I'm not talking about the clerk's office. I'm talking about the relationship between the clerk's office and my client. I, I know that you don't want me, and I understand your decision in this regard with respect to the matters that were covered in the, the, the Quintet investigation. That was an internal matter. Rather, I'm simply asking Ms. McPherson questions about one incident, one event that is illustrative of exactly what happened between the clerk's office and Mr. Norn and has a direct impact on the resources that he had while he was going through this crisis? That's the only reason I'm asking that question, sir. I, I think it's fair to ask as to, is he still getting the services that he wants from the clerk's office? But I get back to what I said at my opening that uh, when I allowed you to uh, cross-examine or lead this witness, uh, and you were the one that uh, indicated that what you wanted to do 
is elicit evidence about how a new first term MLA would have been taught about the members code of conduct, how to deal with prices, how to approach the media, and how to deal with the media requiries. Now it would be quite proper for you to ask is, is because of what was going on in the clerk's office, was he not able to get this service? But I don't want to get into the reasons of what happened in the clerk's office because it's beyond my order in respect to allowing you to examine this witness. So you proceed sir. on that basis. Certainly, sir. I, I would only add that the, the mediation I understand took place was not a function of the clerk's office. It was not within the clerk's office. It wasn't uh, between... It doesn't matter. It's really got nothing to do with what I've just read to you. <laughs> Well, then, Ms. McPherson, given what was going on in the background in April and May of this year, was there any deterioration in the availability of services to Mr. Norn while he was going through what, by any description, was a crisis? No, um, and I will elaborate. There is no question, Mr. Cooper, that Mr. Norn and the Clerk of the Assembly, Mr. Mercer, were at odds. Um, and Mr. Norn was very public about that dispute and his view of the Clerk. However, Mr. Norn continued to receive services from both Deputy Clerks um, and other professionals and staff within the office of the clerk throughout the period of time referenced by you. Um, if one looks at your client's own evidence with respect to his contact with Mr. Rutland and, and the advice and support that he received from Mr. Rutland, Is right that he continued to receive those uh, we, we, we lost, we lost you. A, we lost you again there for a moment. Right. Um, um, it's simply that there's no question, Mr. Cooper, that there was a dispute between Mr. Norn and Mr. Mercer, the clerk. Mr. Rutland, as acting clerk, stepped in and provided support, advice, and assistance throughout to your client um, quite fulsomely in April and May of this year, uh, prior to then and indeed after then. Um, he and other staff members within the Office of the Clerk continued to carry out their role as professionals in supporting Mr. Norn throughout this process. To your knowledge, did anybody in the clerk's office or yourself personally reach out to Mr. Norn to try to help him what, with what was obviously a very difficult time in April and May of this year? It is my understanding that Mr. Rutland was in daily, if not hourly, contact with your client, Mr. Cooper, to support yeah. him. And, and since that time after May to the present time, are you aware of anybody who reached out to Mr. Norn at the clerk's office or yourself to assist him in what was obviously an ongoing problem? and an ongoing crisis? I am. I, Mr. Rutland, until quite recently, was in regular routine contact, daily contact, with your client um, who reached out to him at all hours of the day and night, um, seeking support for a variety of issues. And then even that relationship ended? Indeed, it... Um, became fractured, yes. Okay, thank you. Those are all my questions. I have no questions, Mr. Park. Person, thank you very much for all your assistance. It's been very helpful. I just have one question going back to your integrity commissioner and uh, you mentioned my role, and uh, I found during the 10 years I was conflict of interest commissioner, sometimes on a daily basis, I would have MLAs consulting with me on ethical and conflict of interest problems, and I usually ended up giving a written opinion, and I think the message was 
around the legislature that my mandate is to keep them out of trouble. <laughs> and uh, I, and but I also met with, with the members once a year. That was in the statute to go through their conflict problems and go through their financial returns. Does uh, does uh, Mr. Jones do the same thing in uh, in, in Yellowknife? Um, yes, he does. Um, Justice Barkley, he meets regularly, particularly with new members. Um, I was trying to recall, sir, if Mr. Jones had actually been in attendance um, in October and November uh, of 2019 when we onboarded new members. It would be his practice to come up a minimum of once a year. Um, and I don't recall when he was there but certainly his practice has always been to come early on in the life of an assembly and then to come on an annual basis thereafter. It's also been my experience, I've reached out to Mr. Jones on a number of occasions on a variety of things. Um, for example, doing amendments to part three of the Legislative Assembly and Executive Council Act. Um, Mr. Jones is remarkably accessible by both email and by phone. Um, he's he's truly been a, a real pleasure to deal with and it's very rarely um, longer than an hour or two before he gets back to us. So he has been just uh, a tremendous source of it. Legislative advice. Assembly, I think you're very fortunate to have someone with disability in our association of conflict of interest commissioners and uh, yes. ethics commissioners. He was the go-to person. Yes, yes, he's a remarkable. But I just wanted to, the reason I'm asking this, I just wanted to make sure that both that was all that advice and guidance from ethics and conflicts was available to Mr. Moore. It is, it is, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Well, um, thank you, Ms. McPherson. We are, uh, I suggest we take another break because we're only down to one interpreter, as I understood. And um, in consideration of that, may I suggest that we come back and uh, Five minutes, if that please you, Mr. Burke. That would be fine. At which time we will have Mr. Glenn Ratlin testify. This hearing stands so adjourned, adjourned for five adjourned. minutes.
is now pre now resumed. Just Thank you. Uh, Mr. Barkley, we've had a request uh, from the interpreter if we, that if we take breaks, we should take 10 minute breaks and not five minute breaks. So we're going to honor that. Um, uh, and we really appreciate uh, his or her work. I'm not sure who's doing it today. Um, our next witness is Mr. Uh, Glenn Rutland. And, and uh, I see you there now. And you, uh, good morning, Mr. Rutland. Good morning. And, and you have with you uh, Mr. Toby Kruger, counsel. Yes, good morning. Okay. And so I would ask that the witness be sworn or affirmed. Do you solemnly affirm, Mr. Rutland, that the evidence that you provide today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Could you please state your full name for the record? Uh, my full name is Glenn William Rutland. And Mr. Rutland, what is your current position? I'm currently the acting clerk of the Legislative Assembly. Okay. For the Northwest Territories? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And uh, how long have you held that position? Since February of 2021. Did you hold a position with the Northwest Territories Legislature prior to that? Yes, uh, I was the Deputy Clerk, House Procedure and Committees, uh, starting May 2019 until I became Acting Clerk. Uh, prior to that, I had served at, on a contract basis as Deputy Law Clerk and Law Clerk to the Northwest Territories Legislative Assembly. What's your uh, educational background? I have a degree in political science. I have a post degree certificate in public relations. And I have a law degree. Okay. Did you uh, practice uh, privately? I practiced uh, both with the, I was uh, a lawyer with the Legal Aid Commission in the Northwest Territories, uh, with the GNWT Department of Justice, and then I was in private practice uh, for approximately six years, and it was during my time in private practice that I served as Deputy Law Clerk and Law Clerk to the Assembly. Was, was that private practice in uh, Yellowknife? Yes. Okay. Now, I want to take you uh, to events that occurred in April of this year, um, and in, specifically Wednesday, April 21st, 2021. What was your position with the um, legislature at that time? At that time, I was acting clerk. Okay. And did you, uh, on that date, have contact with Mr. Steve Norn, MLA? Yes, uh, Mr. Norn called me uh, approximately around 7 o'clock uh, and asked if I was available to speak privately. Uh, I told him at the moment that I was not, but that if he could give me 15 minutes, I would call him back when I was able to speak privately. Okay, so did you speak to him 15 minutes later? Uh, approximately 15 minutes later, yes, I did speak with Mr. Noren. I called him. Okay, and can you, can you tell us what the conversation entailed? Uh, yes, Mr. Noren uh, advised me that he had been uh, diagnosed with COVID-19. Uh, he told me that he had been in discussions with the Premier's office uh, regarding that, and he told me that he had gone to get tested uh, following the wastewater advisory uh, going out because he had been self-isolating during that time. 
Okay. And what, if anything, did you say to him during that conversation? Um, I indicated to uh, Mr. Noren, obviously, some concern uh, for his health, uh, obviously being diagnosed with COVID-19, and he told me that he had gone to the isolation center and was isolating there. And where is the isolation center in uh, Yellowknife? Uh, there are several, or there at least at the time, there were several isolation centers, a couple of different hotels. I'm not sure which one uh, he was in. Is, is that the extent of your contact with Mr. Norn on Wednesday, April 21st? Yes. Okay. Did you do anything on Wednesday, April 21st in relation to what Mr. Norn had told you at about 7.15? Uh, yeah. No, I didn't do anything else that night. I went home. Okay. Okay. And then tell us about the next day, Thursday, April 22nd. Was that a work day for you? Yes, it was. Okay. Can you tell us what uh, you did in relation to the information you got from Mr. Norn uh, on Thursday, April 22nd? I shared uh, the information with one deputy clerk at the Legislative Assembly. And then I asked the Sergeant at Arms uh, to simply check the security records uh, for the last couple weeks to see whether Mr. Norn had been in the building or not. Why did you do that? I felt as uh, acting clerk of the Legislative Assembly, I was required to conduct some due diligence. My expectation and my comment to the Sergeant at Arms was, I'm sure he hasn't been here, but that's double check. Okay. Did the Sergeant at Arms report back to you? Yes. Uh, the Sergeant Arms uh, reported to me that Mr. Norn had been at the Legislative Assembly in the afternoon of April 17th and had indicated to me that there was one or two people in the building at the time Mr. Norn was there. And approximately what time would you have been told that by the Sergeant at Arms? I believe it was likely around 1130. Okay. In the morning? Yes. Okay, and what, if anything, did you uh, direct the sergeant at arms to do? It was identified that the security guard who was uh, present when Mr. Norn came into the building was on shift that day. Uh, I directed the sergeant at arms to ask him to leave the building and to arrange to go get a COVID test and follow whatever instructions uh, public health provided him with. Okay, what else, if anything, did you do following that? Uh, I know at one point, uh, under our exposure control uh, program, uh, which was brought in for uh, COVID-19, uh, where there is uh, a report of uh, COVID exposure at the Legislative Assembly, the Sergeant Arm investigates, which is what he does, and then the Le Legislative Assembly communicates with the Department of Health and Social Services to ensure the appropriate measures were taken. Uh, and I uh, arranged to speak with uh, a person at Public Health uh, to advise them of uh, what we had learned and the steps that we had taken in relation to Mr. Brain. Okay. Did, what, if anything, did you do in relation to notifying uh, public health about what you had learned from Mr. Uh, Norn and from the Sergeant at Arms? Uh, when I spoke, I spoke with a public health nurse and I advised that Mr. Norn uh, had been at the building. Uh, they had asked about who was in the building. I advised them that we had uh, a security log which detailed every time someone was in and out of the building that there was only one person who Mr. Norn had contact with 
and that that person had been sent home and had been, uh, we had made arrangements for him to, we booked him a COVID test uh, and we provided public health either with that call or when a subsequent call with uh, Mr. Brain's name and contact information uh, because I believe they intended to follow up uh, with him in relation to his COVID test and result. So did you personally have contact with public health on those matters? Yes, I did by phone. Okay, and was that on uh, Thursday, April 22nd? I believe so. Okay. Why do you believe so? Uh, on uh, April 23rd, uh, after uh, it had been come public about Mr. Norton's diagnosis, uh, we uh, received questions from staff uh, about whether uh, Mr. Norton had been in the building and uh, we advised employees that he had been in the building but it was on a weekend, there was minimal exposure and the one person who had been exposed was no longer at the Legislative Assembly. Um, later that day, uh, we had uh, further media inquiries about Mr. Norton coming to the Legislative Assembly and in our response, uh, we referenced our exposure control plan and that we'd been in contact with public health. Uh, so that's why I believe it was on the 22nd. It may have been uh, on the 23rd uh, before that media response, but I know by midday on Friday, uh, we had uh, indicated that we'd been in contact with public health. Okay. But uh, so you're saying that you believe it was on Thursday, April 22nd, that you initiated that contact with public health? Yes, that's uh, correct. I had reached out uh, to the associate uh, deputy minister responsible for the COVID secretariat to find out who I should speak to at public health because I didn't just want to call anyone. Do you recall who you spoke with at public health? Um, I believe it was Stephanie Gilbert. I don't recall uh, for sure because someone else's name came up on the phone. Uh, it was a different person's name on the phone when I called. Uh, that came up as Riel Nakeko, and then the person explained that they were sharing a desk or sharing shifts. Now, um, did you do anything more in relation to what had been reported to you by the sergeant and arms and what had been reported to you by Mr. Norn in the afternoon of Thursday, April 22nd? Uh, no. Okay. Um, what if anything occurred in the e on the evening of April 22nd? Uh, in the evening of April 22nd, uh, Mr. Norn uh, called me uh, and indicated that uh, he had been advised by the Premier's office that they were receiving media requests uh, from CBC, asking them to confirm that, in fact, Mr. Norn had tested positive uh, for COVID-19 uh, and uh, that they intended on running a story uh, to that effect. So what, what discussion did you have, if any, with uh, Mr. Norn in re after that? Uh, we discussed whether or not Mr. Norn wished uh, to make a statement. Uh, at that time, in advance of a story being uh, produced, or whether he wanted to wait uh, till afterwards to make a comment, or whether he didn't want to comment at all. Uh, I also asked Mr. Norn a number of questions uh, after Mr. Norn indicated um, he was interested in making a statement. I asked him a number of qu questions relating to uh, the circumstances of his travel, uh, his isolation, and 
had a conversation with him about what he wanted to say in the press release. Okay. And did Mr. Uh, Norn tell you what his dates for isolation were? Yes, uh, Mr. Norn uh, advised me that he was in isolation from April 4th to 18th. Um, I know we had conversation back and forth, or I recall having conversation with him um, about the dates uh, because of the fact that he had been at the Legislative Assembly on April 17th. So what if instruction, if any, uh, was given about the preparation of a media statement? Did Mr. Norn want that or not? Yes. Uh, Mr. Norn uh, wanted assistance with a media statement. Uh, he, um, we had a conversation about what it was that he wanted to say. Uh, Mr. Norn at the time was isolating um, at the hotel, uh, didn't have access to a lot of resources. I indicated to Mr. Norn that I would prepare a draft based on the conversation uh, that we had had, uh, and then we proceeded to work on and revise uh, a draft, both by phone, email, and text uh, that evening. Did Mr. Norn say anything uh, that he wanted in the media statement that you said that it was not advisable to do that? Yes, uh, Mr. Norn made a comment about that he had followed all the rules uh, I indicated to Mr. Norn that he cannot say that because he did attend at the Legislative Assembly on April 17th. Um, and uh, I advised him that he shouldn't say that in the press statement. Okay. And did he use that phrase, I followed the rules or followed the rules? Yes, that I remember Mr. Norn saying that. Okay. Did he say anything else about what he wanted in the press release that you advised against? Uh, no, I, I believe we discussed whether or not he wanted to address the fact that he had visited the Legislative Assembly. Um, it was not included in the statement, so uh, my best uh, recollection is that he did not want that in there. When you advised Mr. Norn uh, that it would not be advisable to say that he followed the rules because he had been on the at the legislature on the 17th, did he argue with you at all about that statement? No. Did he ever say anything during your discussions with him that that that? On the 17th, he was not isolating any longer. He did indicate to me that he had some confusion over when his isolation period ended, but subsequent to that day, he understood it ended on April 18th. Uh, okay, did he say to you that he thought it ended on the 17th? Uh, when he when we were discussing him coming to the Legislative Assembly, first uh, he indicated that he had been there on the 18th, and I had indicated that no, the record showed he was there on the 17th. Um, uh, and that, that's, that was the discussion we had about that. Uh, when we were, when I was discussing with him that he returned on April 14th, uh, we talked about the fact that he would be isolating to April 18th. And at the time, Mr. Norn, uh, I believe, agreed with that statement. Yeah. Now, a, a, a did you help prepare the draft of his witness uh, of his uh, media statement? Pardon me. Yes, I prepared. Uh, I offered to type up. Uh, what Mr. Norn, what we had discussed in our conversation. Uh, I believe Mr. Norn only had his phone uh, with him. I prepared a draft 
I provided it to uh, Nicole Bunnell, who is our manager of public affairs, uh, for her to review. Uh, and she provided a comment on it. And then it was sent to Mr. Norn. Uh, and Mr. Norn uh, directed several changes and additions uh, to it uh, throughout the time that we were working on it. OK, and I ask you to um, look at uh, a series of emails that we've uh, marked as Exhibit uh, 37. Uh, do, do you have those or should uh, uh, Madam Clerk put that in front of you? Have you now got in front of you Exhibit 37? Yes. Uh, could you tell us, uh, do you have familiarity with Exhibit 37? Yes, they are. Uh, OK. Yeah. There's, a, there's a couple of emails. Uh, can you tell us about the first one in time? Uh, so the first one, as it was around I was at, sorry, 10.35 p.m. Uh, it was an email from myself uh, to Mr. Norn, uh, copying Ms. Bunnell, um, providing uh, the, a draft statement for his review, uh, and then discussing about sending it out or sending it to CBC once reviewed and approved, uh, and uh, saying that I had prepared the statement below based on our conversation that evening. Okay, and uh, it says, uh, quote, Mr. Norn, here is a draft statement for a review. We can look at sending it out or sending it to Joanne Stason at CBC once you have reviewed and approved it and indicated how you want to distribute it. Just pause there, end of quote. Was that reporter at CBC, uh, someone that was pursuing this story to you know? Uh, I'm not sure which specific reporter at CBC. Uh, Miss uh, Stassen was identified because she is the producer for The Morning Show uh, and would be one of the first people into CBC so that if Mr. Norn wanted his statement uh, out before CBC proceeded with a story, uh, my recommendation was to send it to Ms. Stassen at CBC. And it continues, um, quote, I have prepared the statement below based on our conversation this evening. It is important that all information in the statement be correct and accurate, as I expect the media will be reviewing it closely and seeking to confirm all the facts. Please let us know if anything needs to be changed. End of quote. Um, did Mr. Norn change anything in the statement with respect to his timeline of events? No, uh, Mr. Norn uh, provided uh, direction to add in a comment to the effect that uh, he was not experiencing uh, symptoms or had not been experiencing symptoms uh, from uh, COVID-19 and then a further revision was added to direct or to advise people that his constituency assistance would continue to uh, take calls and provide assistance. And then the email concludes, thanks, uh, excuse me, please call me if you have any questions or wish to discuss, but please confirm approval of the statement by email, end of quote. And did he confirm the statement by email? Yes, he, um, he responded at 11.08 uh, saying, great job guys, approved. Make sure to add that I was not showing any symptoms when I completed my isolation. And that revision is that the email? 
I'm sorry, sorry I interrupted you. No, and that, that was the email at uh, the top of the page. Okay, that's that's on exhibit, uh, it's on the exhibit D, uh, exhibit 37. Uh, and then the final uh, media statement, did it include a uh, reference as Mr. Noren requested that any, uh, that he was not showing any symptoms when he completed his isolation? Yes, that was added. Okay. And then uh, in your email of, uh, and I, you're working here at, at 1035 at night, correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Uh, w was that your normal working hours? Um, generally, uh, no, but as acting clerk, I make myself available uh, in the evenings and on weekends um, for members. Okay. Now, after you... Uh, after Mr. Norn responded at 11.08 p.m. Uh, approving the press release, media release, um, did you have any further contact with him, to your knowledge? Yes, I believe we um, went back and forth. Not sure if it was another round of email or by text, because uh, that's where he indicated he wanted the extra bit added about uh, his constituency assistance as well. And I had um, uh, asked him just to uh, confirm that uh, he wanted the material, the statement released to CBC and then re uh, sent out through the public affairs distribution list uh, the next morning, uh, and that was because we were unable to access uh, that distribution list remotely. Okay, and I wonder if Madam Clerk would put before you um, the affidavit uh, of, or excuse me, the uh, questioning of Mr. Norn in uh, September the 22nd, 2021 which was marked as Exhibit 28, and specifically Exhibit 36, which was attached to that statement, which was Exhibit 5 at Mr. Noren's questioning. Uh, I may have the numbers wrong, but Madam Clerk, uh, I'm looking for the transcript of interview under oath uh, of Stephen Norn on September 22nd, 2021. And Mr. Mr. Barkley uh, helps by pointing out it's at tab 28 of our exhibit book. Looking for the final media statement that's attached there to the transcript I'm sorry, did you say Exhibit 28? Tab 28. It's Tab 28, tab. but it's the transcript under Tab 28 of Mr. Stephen Nord's interview on September 22nd, 2021. Can I clarify, is this a, a 
a transcript? I have the state. Okay, Madam Clerk, per per perhaps we'll take a five minute break so we can locate that. Thank you. This court is adjourned, or this hearing is adjourned for five minutes. Okay, thanks. Thank you, uh, Adam Anderson. Is the uh, document now in front of the witness? Sounds like yes. Okay, so Mr. Mr. Rutland, do you have in front of you um, the uh, press release uh, titled Yellowknife, April 23rd, 2021, Mr. Steve Norm, the MLA for Tuna Will Willaday has issued the following statement. It's been marked Exhibit 36 in these proceedings. You have that? Yes. It is, uh, have you had a chance to look at it? Yes. Is this the final uh, media statement? Yes, with the exception that it was also, uh, it was later uh, sent out in French as well as noted at the bottom. Okay, so uh, the, the next day, um, you did you or who actually sent out the media statement, uh, Exhibit 36? Uh, that would have been sent out by our public affairs and communications uh, group. My expectation is that it was Nicole Bonnell, but anyone from our public affairs group uh, could have been sent it out because it's a generic email address. Okay. And, and uh, on Friday, April 23rd, um, did you become aware of anything in relation to this media release? Yes. Uh, sometime between 8.30 uh, and 9 o'clock, uh, I received a call uh, from a member uh, saying that they had read on cabin radio uh, that uh, Mr. Noren said that he had followed all the rules, uh, but MLAs uh, had been made aware at that point that Mr. Noren had been in the building uh, and was concerned about the statement. When you when you refer to uh, cabin radio, are you referring to uh, something in writing that you had seen? Or are you referring to having heard something on cabin radio? Uh, I I was told that it was posted on uh, cabin radio. Uh, when I arrived at the assembly, 
I took a look at um, the Cabin Radio website, and then I called Mr. Norn. Okay, and what did you see on the Cabin Radio website? Uh, there was a quote from Mr. Norn. I don't remember the exact words, but essentially saying that he had followed all the rules. That was all. I would ask uh, Madam Clerk to uh, go to tab 18 of our exhibit book, which, uh, if my exhibit number is right, is tab is exhibit 17, and put before the witness that affidavit of Ollie Williams, sworn September 10th, 2021. And I asked the witness to look at exhibit B to that affidavit. B. Tell me when you have it, uh, Mr. Rutland. I do have it in front of me. Okay. Would you take a moment uh, just to read to yourself the article to be, uh, I'm going to ask you whether this is the one article that you saw that morning, April 23rd, that uh, led to your conversation with Mr. Norn? Yes, it is. Okay. And in the article, there's reference to him saying uh, that he followed all the rules? Yes, that's correct. Uh, he said, I followed all the Adam. rules. I was up front with everybody, is what's quoted as him saying. Okay. And, and, and that's at uh, page three of six of that document, correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. And when you spoke to Mr. Norn, was that what you were referring him to? Yes, I called Mr. Norn, he answered, and I asked him if he had told Cabin Radio that he had followed all of the rules. Uh, and Mr. Norn uh, replied and asked me whether Ollie Williams had called me. Uh, I told him, no, it's posted on the Cabin Radio website. And what, if anything, did you say to Mr. Uh, Norn about that quote? Uh, I followed all the rules. I was up front with everybody. Uh, I uh, reminded Mr. Norn that I had specifically said, specifically suggested or advised him not to say that uh, because, in fact, he had not uh, because he had attended the Legislative Assembly. Okay, and what did he say to you, if anything? Uh, Mr. Norn was apologetic and was uh, frustrated uh, with uh, Cabin Radio and the Cabin Radio's story and uh, expressed uh, some, uh, you know, expressed that he was not at 100% at the time. Was, was there any uh, discussion about whether there should be a correction to his statement that he made, a media statement earlier, uh, uh, earlier that morning? I asked if Mr. Norrin wanted to uh, make any further statement um, uh, to correct that. And his response? Uh, I don't remember his exact words, but there was no further statement that was issued. Well, did he did he say that he did want to make a, a further statement and you weren't able to facilitate it? Uh, no, there was no direction provided uh, to uh, 
pre prepare another statement. Uh, and a couple hours later, uh, I shared with Mr. Norn uh, what the Legislative Assembly uh, was going to uh, say in terms of confirming that Mr. Norn had been in attendance. Uh, and he replied and appreciated that I uh, shared that with him and that he said he was not taking any further calls uh, from the media. Okay. Um, was there anything further ab about the uh, cabin radio article that you can recall speaking to Mr. Norn about? Uh, Mr. Norn, uh, a couple hours later, texted me and asked me uh, whether cabin radio was uh, regulated by the CRTC. And your and your response? I told him I believed they weren't because they don't broadcast. Do you know why he was making that inquiry? Uh, I can't say uh, for sure. I know he'd expressed frustration with cabin radios reporting to me earlier that day. Okay. What was the frustration? Uh, that they had reported that he had said he had followed all the rules. Okay. And did he deny that he'd said that to Cabin Radio? Uh, no. Okay. Now, an, um, another matter, at, at, uh, at some point during April 21st or 22nd or 23rd or for that matter, at any time, uh, did Mr. Uh, Norn tell you that he had interacted with his daughter during his self-isolation period? He, Mr. Norn, had has told me that at some point. I don't recall whether it was in our first conversation or a subsequent one. Did Mr. Norn tell you at any time that he thought his isolation ended on April 18th? When we were discussing uh, the, the media statement, we discussed that his self-isolation period was April 4th to 18th. Okay. Okay, sure. I have uh, no further questions. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I complete my examination in chief, Mr. Cooper. Uh, I, I expect I'll be taking longer than 15 minutes. Um, I, I'm prepared to go ahead, but I'm in your hands, sir, and the interpreter's hands, I suppose, indirectly, as to whether we proceed now or after lunch. Well, we've received a message. I don't know if you have about a positive uh, COVID-19. Ms. Farrell, you know the story. Could you, uh, why don't you tell us, you tell us the story? Uh, yes, we've been advised uh, that there is a, a positive COVID-19 case within the Legislative Assembly, uh, and therefore, uh, as outlined in the Assembly's exposure control plan, um, the interpreter, the technical team, and the court clerk will be required to leave the building and arrange for testing. Uh, and therefore, we've been advised that the hearing will not be able to continue this afternoon. We have not we had for uh, Mr. Cooper, what what is your uh, with with the that information? Uh, you can go ahead and, uh, and deal with the witness for about fifteen minutes. I'm I'm concerned now that if we can't sit this afternoon, it's going to be adjourned till. Friday, will be, we be able to deal with all these witnesses and, and argument on Friday? No, I don't think so, sir. I think particularly, I mean, the break between the, the last bit of evidence and, and closing is always 
best for everyone and allow us to organize our materials, our case law, et cetera. I, I appreciate that. But, but leaving we'll that as for argument then. Yeah, leave, leaving aside that matter more of convenience and process, um, th th there's no way we'd be able to do all of that in one day. I mean, I, the, the doctor, I, I expect, will probably be a little longer. Um, I'm also interested, before I forget, in getting the um, the uh, what was it? the exposure uh, control protocol that's been raised, and so we can use the opportunity um, to ask for that to be produced. I, I haven't seen that, and it's now come up uh, twice, one, once formally within the hearing and once after. Um, I, I guess rather than just speaking, we can't do it just next Friday. Uh, my next week is, is very busy, including being out of town for a good chunk of it. I, I, I don't know what to suggest specifically at the moment. Well, is there any reason why uh, excluding the argument, which I agree with you, we can't do it all in one day. Is there any reason why we can't go ahead next Friday with the witnesses? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, have that day. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm content with next Friday uh, with the remaining witnesses. Um, and then I guess we'll have to see where uh, where we can find the time to do our, uh, our closing. We can schedule that later on next Friday after we deal with the witnesses. So I guess we should ask uh, Mr. Rutland if he's available next Friday, but I, I, I would think so. I've not discussed this with him. Uh, thank Mr. Uh, Rutland, you hear what we're talking about? Yes, I Friday? can. I will make myself um, available. The one caution I would suggest is that if any of the other technical staff or um, uh, inquiry clerk do test positive and are required to isolate we may not have the resources to proceed uh, next Friday. Well, I appreciate that and um, um, we'll have to cross that bridge when we come to it but your point is well taken. Why don't we adjourn the matter until 9.30 then uh, on next Friday morning? Uh, Sir, if I may, it's Toby Kruger here. Uh, I just, uh, I think that's a, a fine um, suggestion. My only concern is to what extent uh, the witness would be able to uh, effectively carry out his duties as acting clerk for the next week, given that his examination here has been uh, uh, interrupted. Well, I, I, I don't know. So go ahead, Mr. Cooper. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Cooper. Would you you wouldn't consider him to be under cross examination yet? No, but he's certainly under oath, and I don't think that that's a distinction oh, yeah. without difference in my view. So um, I, I don't I, I don't know everything you do, or even really anything that you do, um, Mr. Rutland. I, I I I'm trying to imagine how your um, responsibilities would be impacted by not discussing what we've discussed today. So I, as long as you can assure us. Um, that there's no need for you to speak with Mr. Kruger or anyone about your evidence, I, I don't see the issue. That's really the only prohibition. You, you, you can't go back and, and, and start to look up uh, documents or talk to other people to refresh your memory at this stage. That would not be appropriate. Yeah, and, and It seems to me, Mr. Kruger, that um, I, I don't quarrel with what Ms. Mr. Cooper said, that uh, with the uh, admonishment that we go ahead at 9.30 on, on, on Friday with this witness, unless something tragic happens in, in the meantime, and then we'll be advised and have to assess our position at that time. Yes, and I, you know, I should note as well, I mean, Mr. Rutland's a lawyer, so I mean, he understands, and I've got greater comfort than were he not a lawyer. I would also, though, ask, sir, for your indulgence in uh, extending the subpoena to Mr. Rutland to uh, produce a copy of the uh, exposure, I can't remember the name for some reason, Expo exposure control protocol that he uh, referenced in his evidence. Mr. Rutland? Mr. Rutland, Mr. Kruger, any problem with producing that? Do you have a problem with that, Mr. Rutland? No, there's no issue with producing he that. He doesn't have a problem, Mr. Cooper. He said, he said he will produce it. Well, could I ask to expedite matters? Could you send me a copy uh, of that, and I will, I will uh, make sure that Mr. Cooper gets it as soon as we get it. It's agreeable. Yeah, we'll we'll undertake to do that right away, sir. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Then on that basis, let's adjourn the matter until next Friday at 9.30 a.m. Thank you, sir. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.